Thank you for uh, joining us today for uh, this discussion on the metaverse. Uh, we're pleased to have you. And uh, we're just going to, uh, before I introduce the guests, I'm just going to do a rundown, just do some logistics. Uh, just uh, to tell you, uh, uh, just to introduce CBC, we are a global community of 6,000 plus founders, investors, and operators. Uh, sorry. Uh, today, uh, unfortunately, my FaceTime camera is not working, so uh, you'll be seeing a black screen, but uh, my name is Michael Morgan. Uh, I'm an event lead with CBC's NYC chapter. I earned my BA from Columbia. Uh, I have, uh, I'm currently working in growth and business development at TINA. It's a startup that's aiming to digitize the uh, political polling process. And uh, with us to, or sorry, uh, this is my first, first time hosting, but yeah, just if you can tell us, tell everybody where you're based today in the chat box, that's great. You know what your current rules at you know which companies are and uh yeah for an overview we're we were founded in 2006 and we aim to foster entrepreneurship among columbia alumni students staff uh, etc by facilitating communication providing access to needed resources and creating a vibrant and supportive community uh, our programming uh, includes events and programming, et cetera, in chapter cities, which includes annual demo nights, venture dinners, roundtable discussions, panels and expert presentations. Uh, we also have an online listserv forum where you can discuss ideas and network with 5,800 plus community members. And uh, we also have global programs, which include a content series a VC matching program, a female founder accelerator, and a healthcare network. Uh, to get involved, uh, you know, that would uh, include attending events via Meetup, where you can attend events based on your interests, participate on the listserv via Meetup, where you can share resources, ask questions, and meet like-minded individuals. Join a global program, whether applying as an entrepreneur, a venture capitalist, or a mentor. And you can also apply for a board position, which would uh, include volunteering with the global board, a uh, global program, or a local chapter. And you, know, you can click on this link uh, or type in this link, you know, meetup.com forward slash Columbia VC. And if you're interested in volunteering with us, stay tuned for 2021 nominations, the year 2021 nominations, yeah. Uh, and let's get started. Uh, with us today are uh, Jacob Navok and Matthew Ball. Uh, Jacob is a fellow Columbia alumnus, having graduated from the business school in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. He is the head of Genvid, a company which aims to bring interactivity to uh, live streaming and all its various forms. Whether that be game streaming, live sports broadcasts, or reality TV even. And he previously worked for Square Enix, famous for the Final Fantasy franchise, where he launched their cloud streaming division. Welcome, Jacob. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great to be here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And our next guest is Matthew Ball. Matthew is a managing partner at Apillion Industries, which operates pre-seed and uh, seed venture funds along with a corporate and venture advisory arm. In addition, he is a partner at Makers Fund and is a thought leader on the metaverse, media and beyond. He holds bylines in the New York Times, Bloomberg and The Economist, which recently released a podcast on the very topic we are discussing today, where you can hear his insights. Welcome, Matthew. Nice to be here. All right, thank you. Uh, to get started, uh, the, some, the takeaways that you, the audience, will learn about in today's talk is, you know, that uh, we'll be able to give you a more clear idea of what exactly a metaverse is, why you should be paying attention to it in the first place, who the main players are in terms of its development, and 
hopefully uh, you'll leave with ways uh, and ideas uh, for how to contribute to its development. Uh, firstly, for the both of you, how would you define the metaverse? You know, what core attributes would there be? Should I start or do you want to begin that? Jacob, go ahead. So I think of the metaverse as the next iteration of the internet, which is to say, if you look at the internet as it is today, it was effectively designed for non real time asynchronous communication. There is a web page that goes up, you pull from that web page, you read that information, and then you may post to it. However, we've taken that framework of internet that has existed up until now and applied it to this Zoom call that we're doing right now to real-time video games. And we've effectively molded something that wasn't intended to be massive, real-time, synchronous into what we want it to be. Um, but the network, the code, the underlying way in which the internet was built wasn't designed for that. And so the metaverse is going to be a version of the internet that evolves from the current one where effectively video game-like experiences can happen seamlessly, synchronously, and at scale. And at first blush, this doesn't make a whole lick of sense, but I hope over the course of this hour, it will start to make a lot more sense to people. Yeah, I think Jacob brings up some important points in taking a look at the core infrastructure level challenges and the ways in which the infrastructure has evolved to date is actually really important in answering that. So when Jacob's talking about the idea of synchronicity or persistence, it's important to understand what that would mean for the metaverse, right? If we think about virtual existence, that we can all go into a space that we can live online, we can see the people that we want, those sort of unlocks or enablements are critical, right? When we take a look at today's virtual experiences, there are only a few people who can ever participate in a shared or common space or simulation together. Most of those simulations have defined starts and ends. They reset. Of course, when we take a look at the real world, when you invest in infrastructure, in geography, in building a business, in producing an experience, they don't start and reset and pause. They endure, right? We don't pause the fourth dimension. And so one of the key problems to building a virtual existence or metaverse is that the internet was designed for those reset points. Because it was designed for one-way file transfers or a packet or a message, it was not designed for there to be unending continuity in the transference of a discrete file, a single packet, a one-word message, thanks. It was not designed for a never-ending, simultaneously synchronous experience that everyone participates in. That's partly because no one was trying to build that at the time. It's partly because the technology to build it still doesn't exist today and certainly did not in the 70s and 80s. But when we talk about the metaverse, it's important to distinguish between more social concepts like VR or just Fortnite as it ex exists today, but actually virtual spaces that are unbound by today's limitations in synchronicity and persistence uh, in presence. Oh, yes, uh, clearly a lot to digest uh, as, you know, very innovative, an innovative concept as uh, the metaverse is, you know, meant to be at this time. Um, I guess to uh, kind of specify and kind of uh, drill into the viewer, uh, you know, the importance of it even more further, why does the metaverse matter? Like, what does it do and what opportunities would it present specifically if uh, such a conception, if it can be articulated at the moment? So the, the easiest way to answer the question is to have you rethink a lot of your current assumptions, which is to say, if somebody said to you two years ago, millions of people were going to sit around watching a virtual concert, would you have taken that at its face? Yes or no, right? But that's what we see happening on Fortnite concerts, TikTok concerts, Roblox concerts on a regular basis. The fans are 
generating real time or in some cases pre-recorded music and you're taking your virtual avatar and you're just jamming to it in a virtual space mm -hmm. and relative to a live experience you know you you don't get the same feeling but it's not necessarily a diminished feeling it's just a different type of experience and so when you think about what the metaverse will bring you it's not necessarily about bringing you more or bringing you better it's about bringing you something different that is also appealing and so you may be working in virtual environments most of you are already starting to do that they just happen to be video you may be doing a lot more play inside of game-like worlds you may be simply spending your time inside of them where do they go 50 100 years from now do they look and resemble the matrix potentially right i i don't think that that um is a, a a thing that is out of the question um but in the immediate future you know you you have to ask yourself okay why would i um want to watch a concert inside of a video game and then you know the fact that people are already doing this tells you the answer that there are things that are appealing and so if you think about what we're going to do in the metaverse it's effectively everything that we're doing in reality just rendered through effectively video game like engines yeah and it's it's important to understand how many fundamental premises of existence of commerce of creation of consumption will end up being reinvented in just the same way that web 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, or PC to mobile to social has today. I'll give you one example that Benedict Evans talks about quite frequently. If you go back to the late 2000s and the early 90s even, and you asked people what was the future of the New York Times, you thought of it very incrementally. The answer was the New York Times would be in 2010 or 2020, something that is printed beside you in the morning, right. with only the sections that you're interested in. And of course, that was a totally reasonable frame of reference when you looked at the 90s and you said distribution and infrastructure is now decentralized. It's a local printer. You mm -hmm. say that we now know what you want and what you don't want. So why would we give you some of the stuff that you don't want? And so... In truth, when we get to 2010, what's the future of the New York Times? Well, actually, it's truly a copy that is never printed and one where sections hardly exist at all and where the paper doesn't happen in the morning, it happens throughout the day. And on top of that, you could make an expanded argument that the future of the New York Times is not the New York Times at all. It is a Facebook newsfeed, which is an entirely different product. It's not only never printed, never fixed, but the curation, the editorial process is entirely different. As we look to the metaverse, we have to look at how those same assumptions first feel very incremental, then take leaps and bounds, and then are fundamentally remixed. And so we take a look at commerce today. Most banking today is digitized, right? You don't mm -hmm. have specific sums of money. You haven't in banks for quite some time. But for the most part, our digital information is stored or our financial information is stored digitally so that it can be used physically to purchase a car, to purchase a house, to purchase groceries. What happens when all of a sudden your digital wealth is being used for only digital goods? You might have the linear answer, which is to say, well, it's still money, it's still stored in the cloud, it's still bits and bytes, and so what would be different? We don't know. The answer might be how we store value is entirely different. Another good way to think about this is labor. Right now we have arranged the world, our cities, our infrastructure, based on the belief that people did not have to be co-located, or sorry, that they did need to be co-located to perform key tasks. And so right now we are starting to get to the beginning of remote work through digital video platforms that Jacob and I can be collaborating on his mission while I'm in Toronto and he's in New York and Genvid is incredibly distributed globally. But we're gonna to get to start to the point where you can actually provide labor that requires presence when you're remote. So think about Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, Zoom doesn't solve for a dealer who lives in Ohio. The dealer still has to be at the table. The person who is doing a tour through a museum exhibit has to live by the museum. There's no Zoom substitute. But once you start to get into the metaverse and the roles of labor start to become virtualized, 
then all of a sudden you can say, guess what? The Las Vegas virtual casino is staffed by a Tunisian that a school teacher in Germany ends up providing an immersive experience that's delivered to kids in Akron. And so these are some of the important ways in which we understand that in some regard, the shift to remote work and digital video and Zoom conferences is a very, very early stage. And we know that that's going to transform labor. What's gonna be fascinating is what happens when you have uh, the metaverse, when you hire someone to build you virtual space. Perfect. Uh, yeah, thank you for providing more details and context on that. Uh, one thing that really stood out uh, in your answer, Jacob, was the relevance of game engines, uh, especially with uh, live concerts, particularly uh, in the context of uh, the recent Travis Scott show on over Fortnite. Uh, that kind of uh, branches into, uh, I guess, I guess the importance of the gaming industry and you know driving the metaverse thus far. I know you two both are very uh, bullish on it as a key player in the metaverse's development. Uh, Jacob, uh, given that you also worked at Square Enix for a good amount of time, could you both elaborate on why gaming plays such a huge role? Sure. So uh, the background I have on Zoom right now is uh, Final Fantasy VII background. Um, mm -hmm. When I was at business school, I was debating between going back into finance or joining Square Enix, which is one of the biggest video game publishers in the world based in Japan, do Space Invaders and Tomb Raider, um, Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, and all those titles. And I ended up choosing to go into video games, which was quite unusual for MBAs at the time. Um, and uh, I had a very unique and interesting experience learning about how the industry operates because it has been primarily oriented around real-time um, core entertainment for the bulk of its existence, immersive entertainment. And then as technology evolved, it became less about, let me put a quarter in this arcade game and play for five minutes to let's play on a home console for hours to let me play on my mobile phone wherever I am in the world, um, changing and adapting its experience to the device, to the business model, to the expansion of content. And I, I had a front row seat for all of that. Um, the game engines for people who aren't familiar with it are the software that we use when we create a game to generate the images, make sure that the physics is working, make sure that when you press a button, you see a reaction, et cetera. And for the bulk of our industry's time, you just kind of built one per game. Um, and about 15, 20 years ago, we started to see generic third-party engines like Unity, which just went public and an Unreal Engine that, that publishes Fortnite. Uh, and the more that the engines became generic and not tied to a single game, the more that they were able to have surface area that touched things next to it. So now you have television shows like The Mandalorian that are powered by it. Now you have concerts that are generated in it. Now you have um, cars where you're planning the car and Matt recently shared something on Twitter where you're even looking at your real-time dashboard powered inside of a game engine because what is it doing? It's allowing for us to generate an image that can be moved in real time that is responsive to us. And at the end of the day, that's what a video game does that a movie doesn't. All right, perfect. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, could you, Jacob, could you kind of elaborate on ways that uh, GenVid uh, is sort of trying to uh, create new opportunities within that sector and how it fits into the overall context of the metaverse. And uh, also Matthew, uh, what first drew you to invest in it uh, as well, if you could uh, you know, kind of uh, find a way to, uh, sorry, uh, if you could uh, answer that and kind of uh, sure. start, yeah. Go ahead, Jacob. Okay, so uh, when I was starting at Square Enix, I, I had a very unique experience because we were at the onset of uh, cloud gaming, which a lot of people are talking about these days. We had the first major cloud gaming companies. Uh, one was called OnLive, another one was called Gaigai, come and, and present 
what it was that they were working on. And my boss, who is the CEO of the group, asked me to go and lead the company's charge into this new realm of real-time streaming of games. Again, this was 11 years ago. Um, and the more that I looked and I studied it, the more that I realized the opportunity inside of streaming a game like Netflix wasn't to just have more catalog. It was to have the ability to create game product that couldn't be done except for the fact that it was streaming. What was unique about it? And this is really important in the history of our industry. When you had an arcade machine that fed quarters and couldn't save your state, you had one type of gameplay, Tetris like, you know, experiences. So Pac-Man or um, Galaga. Um, when you moved to home console and you had a battery on your cartridge, you could have long form RPGs like a Final Fantasy or a platform uh, type experience like Super Mario. When you transition to CD-ROM, you could start to have full motion video. Uh, and so every transition of technology allowed for a different type of gameplay experience. And we were convinced that streaming would allow for that too. Um, but over the course of the decade in which we worked on it, uh, we saw something that we didn't expect, which was the onset of the live streaming platforms. So platforms like YouTube and Twitch, and we watched a million people play Pokemon together on Twitch. And that really kind of put a light bulb um, uh, in terms of where we were going. We said, well, maybe the experience isn't about you just playing a game fast, or maybe the experience is about millions of people interacting with the same experience at the same time. And so my company was built to help game developers, tech companies, media platforms generate real-time massive interactive live events. Uh, and, and there isn't another company who provides this platform agnostic tool set in the world today that I'm, a, that I'm aware of um, and that can scale that deeply into a game engine the way that we do. When it comes to the metaverse, for me, the biggest issue right now is that the infrastructure that's required to host a million people in the same session of um, a Travis Scott concert doesn't exist. So when you go and you participate in that concert, you're participating in it with 50 other people. But there is one way in which a million people are simultaneously in the same exact concert, and that's watching a live streamer stream it on Twitch. Uh, and so I believe that those first metaverse-like experiences where you're going to have millions, tens of millions of simultaneous interactions into a singular world or a singular event and not sharded into many hundreds or tens of thousands of miniature versions of that event are gonna come through interactive streams. And so I, I think that in the ensuing years, as you see products that are developed on top of our software, you're going to get the first glimpses of millions of people interacting with an event at the same time. And I think that, that will be a precursor to what those metaverse-like experiences become. That's perfect. And yeah, thank you for that, Jacob. Uh, I'm assuming that was your rationale for investing in uh, Jimbin at the first place, Matthew, correct? Or... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting to talk about these questions of the metaverse and investing, and I'm asked quite often. The right way to think about the metaverse is very similar to taking a look at the internet or mobile. There was no single point in which you say, I'm going to truly invest in mobile. That can be an underlying thesis but the diversity of different ways to invest in mobile. Is it a tower company? Is it a wireless carrier? Is it a hardware manufacturer backend? Is it live operations? Is it content and what type of content? It's very hard to just say, I want to invest in the metaverse. And so here's how I allocate. The way that I think about uh, investing and partnering with companies is really based around from a media perspective or an entertainment perspective or a gaming perspective more specifically is around format discovery and reinvention. How are companies taking existing modalities, hardware assumptions around monetization or devices to reinvent a category? How would you make a game today? Or how would you have made a game 50 years ago if you were availed of today's technology? And so what's inspiring to me about Genvid is how many of those assumptions they're playing with on the technology side, on the creative side, on the publishing side, 
and what that can actually bring to market. And then of course, from a broader perspective, all of these have to fit together towards multiple different points, some of which are just a question of, is the team ready? Is the staff ready? Is the opportunity well-timed rather than just inspiring? And at least in the case of Genvid, there was a lot of alignment there, which is why I think you're going to see a lot of you know, public traction for the company in the ensuing months. Right, there was a question from a panelist that I, I want to respond to now because I think it's relevant now rather than later. Uh, and the question involved, you know, why don't we see more big tech here? Um, and I want to correlate that question to uh, an element of the response that, that Matthew is actually hinting at, which is what are the opportunities for startups and where, where is big tech going to make its place here? Um, the large technology companies, the chipset manufacturers, the network operators all have huge potential in this space, just from the fact that they own massive elements of distribution, wide swaths of content. And the fact of the matter is that all of this is gonna run off of network. And so if you think about where a lot of value is going to be generated, whether it is Epic, whether it is Facebook, whether it is Google, most of these players have been making investments in years toward the kind of infrastructure that's necessary. And that's not by coincidence. So the current CEO of Unity is John Riccatello. I knew him back when he was the CEO of Electronic Arts. And I remember it was either 2011 or 12, we were having breakfast with him back when he was still at EA um, and Wadasan, who was my boss, and the opening conversation that John was giving us was on Snow Crash, which was one of his favorite books that has inspired a lot of the metaverse. Every single thinker in this space, the reason that Mark Zuckerberg bought Oculus was because they believe in this future coming and they are going to incrementally and continuously invest toward it. When it comes to startups, I think it's very hard for a startup to compete in the infrastructure space I think that it's going to be very hard for a startup to compete in this network space, but I think that there are going to be connective tissue technologies that individual platforms won't build by their nature that are going to be opportunity as well as <clears throat> content itself. And so I think that those tend to be some of the most, um, you know, sound elements to invest in, which is to say, I'm a platform agnostic tool. You can use me to stream to YouTube, to Twitch, to Facebook, to Huya in China with Tencent, et cetera. Um, Facebook's not going to build a tool that lets you stream to Twitch or vice versa, right? That's the entire value of a game engine at the end of the day is that you can build it once and have it deployed on Xbox, on PlayStation, on Nintendo, and on phone. So these kind of platform agnostic tools, I think are going to continue to be big and are required for a metaverse-like experience. And the next one, as I said, is content. And by content, I don't necessarily mean games. I mean, everything from word, what is the Slack of the metaverse gonna look like? Is it Slack potentially? Is it something completely different from Slack potentially too? And so I think people who think about how do I create real-time synchronous rendered tools that allow people to work, play, um, mm -hmm. consume content, spend money uh, are going to be large opportunities. And I know that Matt's kind of used that as a lot of his operating thesis for, for his investment fund too. I'll, ask, I'll answer one quick question that was coming in through the chat. Is how do we feel about VR and what Facebook is doing there? And I think it's important to really distinguish between three different points there. Number one is to understand that VR is easily conflated with the metaverse. And the right way to think about this is like saying that the Apple Watch or the iPhone or an Android or an iPad or a PC is the internet. They are important parts of the internet. They are primarily how you access the internet but to describe the internet as an iPhone or even a smartphone uh, is flawed. Uh, you are conflating many, many, many things and then capturing them as just an access endpoint. And so we can take a look at VR being an important way likely of accessing. It will be perhaps the most immersive way of accessing the metaverse, but it is not going to be the primary way. It is not going to be the only way. 
when we talk about VR more specifically, I would attribute something to Philip Rosdale, one of the founders of Second Life. And he used to be a very big believer in VR. And he said something really interesting to me, which was that it was misunderstood or at least underestimated how high the MVP threshold or minimum viable product was for VR, not because of how difficult it was to get a smartphone with a good enough resolution or low enough cost or uh, the battery support to sustain an experience, but that the cost of removing someone's sight, often two senses, including audio, is an extraordinarily high burden to overcome with content. Think about right now, we're on Zoom or you're playing a video game. You can see if your home's on fire. You can see if your dog's getting into trouble. You can see if your family needs you or your daughter is crying. Asking people to remove themselves from a real world and just be in the virtual world is a really high barrier. And so I think there's a good reason why many people have struggled to move on to VR that goes beyond just the cost of the device and the relative performance gap of high quality VR versus the best of what you can get on just a standard gaming experience. Lastly, you're asking about Facebook. Facebook is clearly making some headway with VR and Horizon, but I think it ultimately comes down to this chicken and egg problem. The metaverse is being pioneered by Epic and by Fortnite, and yet they could not have done that if that weren't already a place that everyone wanted to go. And that's a reflection of both the quality of the content and the experience, but also the fact that it was so ubiquitously distributed, right? You can access the Fortnite metaverse, so to speak, from almost any device. And so the challenge for what Facebook is doing here is there isn't really a reason to go into Horizon. There really isn't a compelling reason to go socialize in VR. And then of course, the percentage of the world that can get into VR is very modest. And then if you take a look at the broader ambitions of any metaverse aspirant platform, it's about bringing technologies together. And so the fact that you're limited in hardware, limited in reach, limited in content experience, limited in raison d'etre is all a bit of a challenge there. They're of course aware of this and it will be something that they'll fill in over time. Jacob, I think you wanted to answer to this question as well. So I have very strong perspectives on here. Uh, you've addressed a good portion of them already, which is to say VR is an output solution. It's a way of watching something differently, but it doesn't change the fundamental problems. I still, even if I'm watching a Travis Scott concert in VR, I'm watching it with 50 others, not 500,000 others in the same session. Um, and so that question of, how do you help enable the metaverse comes, you know, very strongly toward, we have to rethink the way that the internet is structured. We have to design networks to operate synchronously to allow for a million people to connect to that same event. Um, and that is going to take a lot of time. Uh, and this also, you know, relates to Baker's question in the chat about R and D costs, because for the, live public companies, even if I go and create a metaverse-like experience that's meant for 1 million people to connect to it, the game engines won't support that. I still have to shard. The servers don't support that. They're still not big enough or strong enough. The networks still don't support that. They're meant for little kind of ping pong passes. And so what you need is companies like Epic to invest further into the ability for their engine to handle all those simultaneous connections. You need the chipset manufacturers to help develop processors that will then be deployed by infrastructure companies like Amazon that can handle and are designed for these kind of connections. And you need the telecom companies to think about the way that their networks are designed and be capable of handling on the back end of their networks all of those simultaneous connections. And what's happened during COVID where we're all moving toward these real-time video streams is certainly helping in the latter because they're taking in way more capacity for real-time video than they were expecting. And there's not you know, that many steps further from needing to do real-time video than uh, needing to have you know, many people connect to it. But there's a reason that Zoom, Google Meet, et cetera, has a limit in the number of people who can simultaneous talk right? Because that network of real-time connections just doesn't scale very well yet. 
but they're all working on it. And now that there is a business case to be done, right, which hadn't been there before, they will incrementally invest over the course of the next decade to get us to a place where we are better positioned for those metaverse-like experiences that I'm imagining. There's one other, you know, subset of this discussion that I think is relevant, which is I think people have a misunderstanding sometimes about what the metaverse is. They look at Fortnite and they think that's a metaverse, or they look at Roblox and they think that's a metaverse. There is no a metaverse. That's like saying YouTube is an internet and that Google is an internet. Um, the metaverse is a network structure. There is only ever going to be one of them. The experiences that Fortnite is enabling, the experiences that Roblox is enabling are metaverse-like experiences that sit on top of our current infrastructure. And it's kind of like, if you remember, you know, old iPhones that were connected to 3G, you could download a photo slowly, but there was no way you were gonna have a real-time Zoom call or have a FaceTime call or watch Netflix video on them up until the network improved, right? Um, it is thanks to improvements in bandwidth latency and other hard problems that need to be solved that we have the experiences that we have today. And eventually where it goes are crazy things like holodex, but again, 50 years from now. <laughs> All right, yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I know that we're, a bit short for time. So I'm going to try and just, uh, you know, kind of propel the uh, conversation a bit more forward. Uh, I wanted to touch on uh, just more on Epic Games and their flywheel and how that uh, sort of works to help propel the metaverse's development. If you could uh, explain that a bit. Yeah, it's very interesting because a lot of what we're able to discuss right now is because Fortnite was so successful. You know, without Fortnite's success, Epic wouldn't have the cash to further invest into its engine. Um, and the engine businesses, and, and I come from building middleware, right, are not the biggest money-making businesses in the space. Um, content is in games. It's just the reality of the situation. But by having a huge success in content, they have been able to further invest into amazing physics, um, incredible lighting, real-time ray tracing and rendering, and all of these things that are going to be critical to the future of the metaverse, as well as the online services that are required to get connection at scale. So, you know, I think we'd be having a very different discussion if Fortnite isn't where it is today, not because of what it shows for the metaverse, but just because it enables Epic to further invest into every other part of its flywheel. Yeah, I mean, what's so fascinating here is if there's anything that I think the viewers need to understand from this conversation, it is Jacob's point on understanding, understanding that the metaverse is a collection of quasi-bundled technologies, some physical infrastructure, some standard, some software, some experiences, some content. And so at the same time, when you see how the metaverse will evolve, it will be much like the internet in leaps and bounds with some proprietary, some collaborative, some open, some public experiences. And so what we're seeing with Epic and the Epic Games flywheel is how they are able to leverage their ongoing success into building more privately, more together and pioneering more use cases for third parties. So we start to take a look at what are some of the elements required for the metaverse. Interconnection, interoperability, important. They are building through their publishing organization, through the Epic Games Store, through Epic Online Services, through Fortnite's trans and cross media, multi IP experiences, a lot of that commonality. Building use cases, monetization, proof cases, for the metaverse. And so it is clear that Unreal, like Unity, we're forging forward into the future, bringing the metaverse earlier than it would have otherwise come. But it's that flywheel that is collaborating with internal and outside parties to bring it faster, more dynamically, and with more user centricity, and perhaps most important, from without 
the major FANG ecosystems, the closed companies that already dominate the world today. That's inspiring at the minimum because it means that another tech giant might emerge as a potential counterbalance. It's expiring, inspiring at the maximum to understand that its focus may be on enabling more tech giants rather than just trying to become one themselves. Perfect, thank you for that. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to touch upon that I feel is not kind of discussed enough is the role of Tencent. Uh, they own quite a huge stake in Epic Games and I do believe that uh, they are an investor in Genvid, Jacob. Yeah, uh, they are. Yeah. Uh, and, so just, I wanted to touch upon, you know, the role of Tencent in the metaverse, whether they have a mission, whether there's any indication that they may be inching towards its developments, you know, could you, could you, both of you elaborate on that a bit? Tencent has made a very wide series of bets that one of the main futures of leisure and entertainment is going to be interactive content. And they are making that bet across studios, publishers, tech companies around the world. Um, this is, if you've got the capital to do it, one of the smartest ways <laughs> to help facilitate the growth. And, and it, for me, it's like a, a basically just one big bet that interactive entertainment is gonna grow by leaps and bounds. I don't know that there is an intentional plan toward the metaverse so much as there is a strong belief that games are going to continue to grow significantly as a use of people's time, as a way in which people monetize, and also as a way in which all of entertainment gets connected. Right. Okay. Um, also, Matthew, you did mention that a Chinese metaverse could look different from a Western metaverse. Uh, given Tencent's kind of ambitions and also investments worldwide, wouldn't that kind of blur the distinction between a Chinese and a Western metaverse at all? Yeah, I mean, so, so to color in some of what Jacob is talking about, right, you have to think that if the fundamental premise for the metaverse is interoperability, the expansiveness of technology, content experiences, uh, customers, e-commerce, users, then the fact that Tencent operates so many things across so many levels of the stack with such breadth, with so many hooks into the ecosystem, provides unique opportunity to bring forward the metaverse. So you're asking about how the Western one would be different. And I would say two things. Number one is the degree of control in one entity for the metaverse will itself provide a slight flavor to it, right? In the sense of a Western metaverse may perhaps be more collaborative, more disassociative, more standards-based than an Asian one would be given the concentration of power. But separately, we should take a look at this from the fact that the Chinese web is already very different from the Western web. And so one of the ways to think about the metaverse is if our lives went online, now our lives are digital and they're going virtual, the significance of regulation, of control, of influence, of information, everything that is currently today governed by internet rules, not literal laws, but how we behave and what the dynamics, social and otherwise are, those will become intensified in the metaverse era. And therefore the strength of the Chinese web, the importance of regulatory controls there will be intensified even farther. The importance for the CCP to monitor activities will go up. And so that will drive an even bigger division between the Western and Eastern web than we've seen today. And then of course, more broadly, there are already three or four, you know, effectively forked versions of the web today. That will be true in the metaverse. So th this is a good opportunity to connect some of the questions that have been asked. And I do wanna begin tackling them. And let's start with what you've just said, Matthew, relative to Kyle's question on a metaverse that's headless. If we think about the way in which the internet conjoins and is fractured today, it will be the same case here, which is to say, there's going to be a headless metaverse um, where you know the, people's experiences need to be accounted for it. But um, what you're going to see is the same way in which our government goes and 
a tax um, tech companies for their data practices or you know the Chinese government for its behavior toward firewalls, it's only going to get more intense here, right? And if you think about where this entire concept of metaverse really goes, there are significant public policy, banking, criminal slash you know um, felony um, law concepts, as well as even things like DMCA that need to be rethought because it's just not appropriate to what this is going to be like. And if we think about what GDPR was trying to accomplish, that's just on asynchronous data. How do you even deal with real-time data management and transfer in a world like this, which is going to be even more intimate than the kind of data that they're storing about us today? So there are significant questions that are going to need to be tackled. I suspect that similar to the current internet, they're going to be tackled in fractured jumbles. Um, and I don't know that there is any better way around that. Um, if anything, the, the scariest form of metaverse, which is the one that Tim Sweeney has been rallying against for years, is a metaverse that's controlled by one or two large corporations, as opposed to the way in which the internet was invented, which were a series of open protocols that anybody could go ahead and modify. Um, and so, you know, how it will end up, I, I don't really know. But I know that a lot of Epic's goals here are to create open standards, are to enable people to build without, you know, needing to um, go through only one or two gatekeepers. And Matt, it looks like you want to say something, so I'll, I'll pass the ball over to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, at a core level, it's important to understand how many of today's social problems remain unsolved misinformation, radicalization, data security, all of these core elements or even data rights have not yet been resolved. And in fact, we see many pernicious outcomes in today's web structures, closed platforms, uh, monopoly-esque power, consolidation of markets, those aren't solved. And there's an optimism that comes from the idea that we have yet another technological or platform shift that this one is bigger and more decentralized. That provides an opportunity to reset the table, right? In yeah. new standards. However, we should also remain skeptical that today's problems won't actually be exacerbated, right? Yep. Radicalization is hard when QAnon is the chat room. Imagine what happens to radicalization when QAnon is a virtually persistent, uh, synchronous, sheltered place on decentralized uh, technology. Yep. At the same time, and I think this is what Jacob is alluding to, one of the reasons why the early web of the 90s and 2000s was so fertile was because of its anchoring in open standards. Those open standards weren't an accident. It's because the internet itself came from public research universities, nonprofits, yep. and governments that were not designing the web for commercial purposes. Think about the mere fact that we think of the internet today being overloaded with advertisements. And yet when the web was designed, no one was trying to create a digital e-commerce or digital advertising platform. It stands to reason that if the metaverse is pioneered by companies with those explicit goals, rather than nonprofit goals that are, were organized around the sharing of information by universities and defense departments, but instead for e-commerce for selling more widgets, we might actually see a world that not only exacerbates underlying issues, uh, societal, but also from an economic perspective. And I think as part of that, it's really interesting to take a look at some of the acquisitions that Epic has made, that Microsoft has made, which is a really renewed focus on this idea of safe spaces, of child protection, of toxicity on the internet, a particularly firm area of investment at Microsoft. And this is because they are trying to be proactive about the idea that if this is one of the next great leaps in modernity, we need to make sure that we don't go in there recklessly, that it is not focused on another industrial revolution per se, but about making the next world better than the last one. But these are really hard problems. Indeed. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, there's one last question that I do want to ask. Uh, because I feel like it needs to be. Uh, given Jacob's uh, 
you know, little bits about gatekeepers and the feuds uh, between Apple and Epic regarding the App Store and Fortnite. Uh, could you just kind of, uh, you know, I guess uh, elaborate more on that and how it fits into the development of the metaverse as a whole? I will speak briefly and then I'll, I'll toss this over to Matt, but uh, yeah. so I don't fanboy very many people, but I think that we're very lucky that Tim is running Epic because he's the genuine deal. I mean, he's just already rich and he uses his money to buy forest land. And when he talks about wanting to fight Apple for the developers and wanting to create open ecosystems, he means it. it he just means it. I know him the guy for years. That's real. And the people who are in charge of these companies, the people who are making the decisions here absolutely do make a difference. The companies are nothing more than organizations of people. And the one at the top determines the culture. And so because he is trying to fight for and believes in for open decentralized metaverses, we have a better chance at that happening. But I'll pass the mic over to that. Yeah, I mean, a really interesting way to think about this is from the perspective of the economic principles we know, not just in the importance of competition, but how do we think about the strength of an economy uh, of China growing over the last 20 years? It is the success of the middle class, of the SMB, of the entrepreneur. And the conquest that Epic has against Apple is really important to be understood in that context. It is not one about making the 10 largest companies larger, more secure, more profitable. It is about ensuring that there is an ever growing middle class a dream in the metaverse of being successful, of producing content and experiences and technology that are enriching, that help others, that produce economic value that is distributed or at least goes to the individual responsible for it, as opposed to tithes up and down to the largest infrastructure players in the world, the largest direct to consumer platforms in the world. If you believe in the importance of the middle class, the SMB, the entrepreneur, that is the bet that Epic is making. That is why the Epic v. Apple case is so important. And I think it's really interesting to put it in that regard, which is we can talk about precedent case study, the applicability of 1920s or even 1980s regulatory policy. But right now, the single most successful product in history is the iPhone. The single most valuable company in the world is Apple. The single most cash generative company in the world is Apple. The pro forma evolution of the metaverse will be constrained by the decisions that Apple makes, that the economics of Apple's stewardship will mean that the vast majority of profits go not to the creator, not to the middle class, not to the SMB, not to those with an idea, but to those who already control the platform. And that platform also controls the standards through its largesse. And so that's a really important mission that Tim has. And as Jacob alluded to, we're really lucky that Tim not only holds those values, but also has the opportunity to act. Most companies in the world do not have the majority of their digital revenues come from outside of the iOS ecosystem. In fact, a minority of Fortnite revenues come from iOS. Most companies are not majority owned and controlled by a single shareholder. Epic is. Most companies, if they can get into a skirmish with Apple, would devastate much of the secondary economy, right? Microsoft were to get into a suit with Apple, would see Microsoft Office crumble. And it's not that Microsoft would be harming its own business, it's that it in turn would be harming the rest of the commercial industry, the businesses that depend on office. And so we sit at Fortnite and Tim Sweeney in a really specific, unique opportunity that we're very lucky for. We have, we have four minutes and we have four questions yes. that have been asked. And I'm, I'm gonna try to briefly get to a couple of them. Uh, I'm gonna go in a random order here. There was a question from an anonymous attendee. Companies use exclusive hard to replicate manufacturing to gain an edge. Can this be, e.g., creating the Travis concert, Scott concert be patented? Um, generally, in the internet industry, it's not 
hard to replicate manufacturing, it's data and network effects that create sustainable barriers to entry for companies. Um, when it comes to the creation of metaverse like events like Travis Scott, the underlying tools to do so are things like the game engine, right? And so those have been built over the last 15 years. They Patents don't really make a difference here. It's just becoming a standard. I can go and patent a lot of things, but if I can't get developers to use my software, it doesn't matter anymore. Um, and so, you know, when you think about what's going to help enable a lot of those experiences, it comes back to the game engine, which is why it was a critical point of the topic before. Um, another question here that was asked, what guideposts um, technologically, culturally will tell us that the metaverse is on the cusp of entering escape velocity? It's a great question because I don't know what this end metaverse is actually going to look like. All I can say is look at more and more forms of entertainment that weren't video games occurring inside of a game engine, whether that is reality TV shows, whether that is um, stuff like virtual concerts, and at some point in the near future, versions of Slack. Right? That'll tell you where incremental progress is coming from. Yeah, I mean, I think you can look over the individual bridges that are being pioneered. Cross-platform virtual worlds and experiences when it was an important advance to the metaverse. That bridge was crossed, that brook was crossed. You can also take a look at the ways in which intellectual property is starting to converge in virtual worlds. That interoperability is another important brook to get over. You can also take a look at the ways in which we're now fighting to connect platforms that gets to the Epic v. Apple fight today, which is saying that let's take certain closed platforms, let's preserve or at least provide structure for that existing business but let's also allow for other systems, whether that's in-app payments or app distribution to get in there. And so we see all of these elements, right? Some of those are in partnerships and interoperability. Some of that is in infrastructure. It's important to recognize most games couldn't have a hundred concurrent users in them before. We're probably at a point in which 500, maybe a thousand are possible. And so it's never that all of a sudden we go from a hundred person battle royale to a million person battle royale, thousand because whether or not that's good is actually a reflection of game design. But what's important is we don't suddenly go from a hundred to a million. It's a constant improvement in CCUs or concurrent users. And so we're seeing this technological innovation over time. Sometimes you see that bridge crossed with crossplay. Sometimes it's about persistent growth in enabling technology. And I think we've got one more question if you wanna hit it, Jacob. Uh, was this about the ways in which the metaverse will play back in the real world? Um, what are some of the most was, interesting ways in which the metaverse will play back into the real world? Disney in a frozen watch party followed by a neighborhood scavenger hunt in select cities. I find it very hard to answer because I, if I could picture the way in which the metaverse was going to really unfold, um, I would probably just be making that content. <laughs> And so I, I wish I had a better answer than the one that I have other than Pokemon Go is probably the, the lightest first step toward whatever this is going to look like. All right then. Uh, well, I believe that concludes uh, today's session on the metaverse as all the Q and A's have been you know, addressed. Uh, thank you, Matthew and Jacob, for your time. It's been a very informative past hour. Uh, hope everybody appreciated the, their perspective and that you walked away from this event, you know, better informed than before. Uh, thanks to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, again. everyone. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Yep. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.